Kathy, would you like to introduce our speakers? Yep, so we're really delighted to begin with the uh, integration of genomics and cancer paper, and the two authors who were predominantly responsible for that paper are joining us today, and the first is Dr. Erica Santos, um, and she's actually joining us from Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, and is uh, currently working at the hospital AC Carmago in their oncology and hereditary colorectal cancer program there. And in addition at that facility, she's also the supervisor for their graduate program, and she teaches oncology nursing. Um, Erica is very active in the International Society of Nurses and Genetics and is the editor of the newsletter, um, and she's been the editor for several years now. And then Dr. Deborah McDonald is also joining us. She'll speak second in the, this particular presentation. Uh, and since January, Deborah's been working with me here at the National Cancer Institute in the Center for Cancer Research and the Genetics Branch. Uh, prior to that, she's had an illustrious career in cancer genetics, uh, first at Massachusetts General Hospital and then for many years now at the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center in their clinical cancer genetics program that she helped develop there with the team. Um, she's been a, a long-standing member of ISONG and also was a former president of the International Society of Nurses and Genetics. So I'm going to turn it over to the both of them. Um, hello to all. Uh, my name is Erica Santos. Uh, Deborah McDonald and I will talk in the next 20 minutes about integration uh, of genomics and cancer care. On behalf of all the authors in this paper, we'd like to thank NIH for this opportunity to talk about uh, with you about this issue. Uh, next, please. Next slide. So the aim is to introduce how genetics and genomics are integrated into cancer care from prevention to treatment. Next. So the presentation will cover five topics, etiology of cancer, cancer risk assessment, tumor profiling, pharmacogenomics, and target cancer therapy. Next. So we decided to use a cancer study approach. So Mr. J is a 41 years old um, European ancestry. His biopsy showed a right side colon cancer and two polyps. Uh, he had no prior cancer history and his medical uh, history was unremarkable. Next. Uh, this is Mr. J pedigree, so we can see here that he had uh, colon cancer at age of 41 and two polyps. His father had colon cancer at age of 41, 50. Uh, his father had uh, uh, his aunt had uterine can cancer at the age of 43, and his grandmother had uh, colon cancer at the age of 52. So we will discuss this, uh, the implication of his personal cancer history and his familial cancer history later on. But first of all, I would like to talk with you about the etiology of cancer and cancer is as a genetic disease. Next. So cancer is a genetic disease, is multifactorial, and infection, infection and chemical products and radiation um, alters DNA structure. So genetic and genomic factors underlie the etiology of all cancers. Next. So it's important that we know the etiology of cancer and know all risk factors that are related to the cancer development because this is important for cancer risk assessment. So there are different risk factors that are related to the cancer development and nurses must recognize those risk factors and uh, the radiation, chemical, biological and one of the important risk factors are genetic susceptibility. Uh, next. So if we 
according to cancer history, uh, family history, tumors can be classified as sporadic, familial, and hereditary. Um, this is has very important implications for the development of strategies for monitoring uh, individuals and also at-risk family members. Next. Uh, sporadic tumors uh, account for 75% of all cancers and usually occurs at an age of onset that is expected for this the kind of cancer that we are talking about. For example, um, colon cancer at age of 65. Um, they are related to somatic uh, mutations in a specific tissue. Uh, for example, uh, breast or colon cancer, for example. Next. Um, on the other hand, if sometimes we can see the same time of cancer occurring at the expect age, but in more than one close relative on the same side of the family, uh, for example, two siblings with colon cancer after the age of 60 or two sisters with breast cancer with age of 65, and sometimes this is referred as familial cancer. Um, this accounts for to, uh, 10 to 15 percent of uh, all cancers, and this is likely the combination of environmental and genomic influences that are shared by close relatives, and or uh, low penetrance genes or uh, SNPs. Next. And 5 to 10 percent of all cancers are hereditary, and they are due to a single gene mutation in the germline that predispose an individual to developing certain cancers. Um, the hallmark is uh, an early age at onset that normally the expected for a particular cancer, for example, uh, colon cancer at age of 30 or breast cancer uh, age of 30. Uh, and this is, as I said, a general limitation uh, that is usually related to this kind of cancer. Next. So most general limitations are transmitted to the offspring by the mother or the father during conception. And somatic mutations, on the other hand, are not transmittable uh, and they are they occur into somatic tissues. Um, next. So how important is to recognize the difference among acquired and heritable genetic mutation? This is very important because it's the key to appropriate referral and further evaluation. And how can we achieve that? Next. One of the tools is cancer risk assessment. And cancer risk assessment is uh, used to define cancer risk um, for the clients and family members. And this is uh, used to, through the collection for person, with personal health and family history. Um, through cancer risk assessment, we can identify individuals who might benefit from genetic and genomic testing, and also we can provide uh, cancer screening strategies for those uh, individuals. Uh, and cancer risk assessment is a very important uh, tool to access psychosocial and cultural implications for cancer risk assessment. And the mo one of the most important thing is, is to provide education, counseling, and to facilitate informed decision making. Next. But when we consider uh, the cancer risk assessment, of course, it's not possible to refer all patients to cancer risk assessment. So we need to identify those individuals who who should be benefit with this uh, strategy. So we have the red flags. Uh, so red flags are uh, features on personal or family uh, history of cancer that draw attention um, 
to uh, suspect familial or um, uh, hereditary cancer. So these are the red flags. Um, they are only an indication for an investigation. So we have here earlier age of cancer, onset than expected, same time of cancer in two or more close relatives, two or more primary cancer in the same person, and the constellation of uh, cancers characteristic of hereditary syndrome, for example, breast and ovarian cancer, or colon and uterine cancer, and some uh, male breast cancer, ovarian cancer, thyroid cancer, and any, any age, uh, particular, actually mandatory thyroid cancer at any age, and a mutation that uh, in a family. So uh, if we next, if now we come back to our case, uh, our pedigree, next, uh, we can see now, if we come back to our case study of the pedigree of Mr. J, we can check some red flags here. So we have age at diagnosis earlier than expected, uh, more than uh, colon cancers, three cases of colon cancer, which is not expected here, so we have three cases of colon cancer, and we have also a constellation of a syndrome, which is uterine cancer in colon cancer, which is characteristic of a syndrome. So based on these characteristics, Mr. J was referred for evaluation and molecular investigation and discussed it with the patient. So now uh, Deborah will continue with the, the presentation. Okay, so thank you, Erica. Now turning to pro tumor profiling, um, this is the evaluation of uh, genomic factors, so not just individual genes, but um, the study of one's entire genetic makeup. Proteomics, the study of the structure and function of proteins. And epigenetics are factors that can change the expression of a gene or the physical, physiologic, or biochemical characteristics of an individual that are not due to a change in the DNA. So here if we take our example of tumor profiling by a process known as immunohistochemistry or IHC, in Mr. J's case, this test is performed in the pathology lab on tumor tissue to screen for Lynch syndrome by examining the protein expression of the four primary mismatch repair genes that are associated with the syndrome. And as you can see, um, there is very little expression of MLH1 here, protein product, as compared to the expression of the other three genes, suggesting that the MLH1 gene uh, could be mutated. This helps to guide genetic testing by targeting testing to this specific gene uh, rather than testing for all four genes, and thus it's a more effective and a less costly strategy. So microsatellite Instability testing, or MSI, is another laboratory test that when uh, microsatellite instability is found, it suggests that the individual has Lynch syndrome. However, about 10 to 15 percent of uh, microsatellite instability is present in various sporadic cancers, so this is a clue, as is IHC, that there could be an underlying genetic susceptibility uh, to colon cancer, specifically here, uh, Lynch syndrome. Um, MSI testing requires tumor tissue as well as non-cancerous tissue as seen here. We've got the normal tissue and the tumor tissue. Uh, and, which, and the normal tissue could be that from a surgical specimen or a blood sample. So the tumor is classified as unstable when there are short repetitive um, sequences of the DNA base in at least 30 percent of five or more markers analyzed. Here, it's shown as uh, repeats of CACACA, or cytosine and adenosine, two of the four chemical bases that make up uh, DNA. MSI testing uh, is also used in early stage colorectal cancer to guide choice of chemotherapy, since microsatellite unstable tumors are resistant to um, 5-FU. 
Uh, this is an example of an algorithm for evaluating a colorectal cancer case. Other algorithms such as that updated yearly in the uh, U.S. by the National Conference of Cancer Network, the NCCN, are also available to guide genetic and genomic testing. And nowadays it's becoming much more commonplace, at least in the United States, to initiate tumor testing for Lynch syndrome with IHC and or MSI at the time of initial diagnosis of a colon cancer. And in a case where there is uh, less suspicion of Lynch syndrome, for instance, some institutions might be performing uh, BRAF testing um, when MLH1 is deficient on IHC. And the BRAF testing can be used to rule out Lynch syndrome quickly and less costly than going to um, genetic testing by sequencing. The common V600E mutation in BRAF is present is evidence of of sporadic versus hereditary colorectal cancer. This here shows the DNA sequencing output for Mr. J. As we discussed, his tumor revealed absence of the MLH1 protein, so the next step then is the targeted sequencing of the MLH1 gene. Here, this testing identified a DNA change at position 1975. Uh, you can see that the normal sequence, CGA, and arginine was uh, changed to TGA, so a thymine in place of um, a cytosine, resulting in what should have been the amino acid arginine being changed to a, to a stop codon, which terminates translation of the gene. Um, this particular mutation is a well-known pathogenic mutation in the United States, the United Kingdom, and Finland. Um, here, uh, this shows microarray, which is a means of looking at the DNA expression of multiple genes simultaneously using a chip or other platform. Uh, shown here, we use fluorescent dyes to identify gene expression. A commonly used microarray in early stage breast and colon cancers to help in deciding whether or not to undergo uh, chemotherapy is the Oncotype uh, DX test which gives a score of the likelihood of cancer recurrence. So a low score would indicate a low chance of recurrence and thus that the individual would likely receive little benefit from chemotherapy, whereas a high score would indicate a higher risk of recurrence and a greater uh, chemo benefit. I'm turning to SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, or um, that is relatively common changes found in a population. Here we want to point out that four new SNPs associated with a colorectal cancer were identified via microarray analysis, uh, which when taken together with 10 previously identified uh, SNPs may account for about 6% of familial colorectal cancer. Other SNPs have been identified that are associated with prognosis and morbidity. Um, for example, uh, SNPs have been found that are associated with lymphedema and breast cancer. And this knowledge can help nurses to educate women about means to reduce the likelihood or severity of uh, lymphedema. Pharmacogenetics examines how genes influence drug actions, including metabolism, response, and toxicity or side effects. For example, as much as 20% of drug metabolism has been attributed to the P450 CYP2D6 enzyme, including response to tamoxifen, and uh, response to the commonly used antidepressants, um, trade names Prozac and Paxil, which are also sometimes used to decrease hot flashes. So certain variants in CYP2D6 are associated with diminished response to these drugs, and thus the benefit would be nil or suboptimal. Many SNPs have been identified through GWAS, or genome-wide association studies, as was discussed by Dr. Yvette Conley in the February 19th webinar. Targeted therapy is another example of personalized medicine based on molecular features of a patient's tumor. So drugs such as trastuzumab, um, trade name Herceptin, the first targeted medicine which was approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration uh, in 1998, are used in human epidermal uh, receptor 2 HER2-positive breast cancers to block cancer growth 
by binding um, to the receptor site on the breast cancer cells. Now, since the advent of Herceptin, um, bone marrow or stem cell transfer for breast cancer has pretty much become obsolete. Now, bevacizumab or Avestin is another monoclonal antibody. Um, it's used to inhibit the growth of new blood vessels in several cancers. On this slide, which is in our article, shows how different drugs are used based on one's uh, genes uh, and, and how they influence drug response. So nurses could use this to explain um, to patients who may wonder why they are get it, not getting the same treatment as someone they know who has the same cancer. Back to Mr. J here, tumor testing for microsatellite instability helped guide the choice of chemotherapy and immunohistochemistry helped to determine the specific gene that was involved in his developing colon cancer. And this provided uh, very important information for the patient in terms of his current care, as well as guiding uh, future cancer surveillance for him um, since he would need more frequent colonoscopy as well as other tests for the Lynch syndrome associated cancers than would someone um, without this syndrome. And this also provided important information for determining cancer risk and guiding screening and early detection strategies for his family, um, as summed up in the next slide, uh, including for his um, sister, his paternal aunt, and her adult children, and uh, for his own daughter when she reaches adulthood and the age at which she would be at risk and need to have um, strategies initiated if she carried the same mutation. Okay, so in conclusion then, we've given you a glimpse into how genomics is changing cancer care today, and as such, informed nurses can educate and support patients in how genetics and genomics impacts the continuum of cancer care, as well as risk management and the treatment they receive. A table two in our article lists clinical resources to familiarize and keep nurses up to date regarding genetics and genomics. And clearly, uh, genetics and genomics is changing the way cancer care is practiced. And nurses play a key role in helping patients and families understand these new developments and how they impact um, cancer and many other areas of health care. And thank you for listening to our presentation summarizing the article titled Integration of Genetics and Cancer Care in the First Quarter 2013 issue of the Journal of Nursing Scholarship uh, dedicated to advances in genomics impacting cancer care and nursing practice. Um, we have a few minutes, I believe, before Dr. Siebert's presentation on caring for individuals with genetic skin diseases um, to answer any questions. So I've opened the microphones for Dr. McDonald and Dr. Santos to be able to answer any questions that come up. Um, should you have a question, please type them in. Um, how important do you think that cancer genomics is for the care of cancer patients at this point in time? Either of you want to answer that? Sure. Well, I think as we've shown, um, certainly in breast cancer and in colon cancer, and we didn't give um, any other examples, but in um, um, lung cancer, uh, melanoma, um, other cancers, we're beginning to um, use um, personalized care and genomics in uh, guiding the care, as we've shown, and how patients will respond to certain therapies so that we could um, change the therapy if the genetic makeup shows that they don't respond to that therapy or uh, in other ways such as that. Um, Erica, did you want to add anything? No, I think it is, uh, as we advance, we, we, we are going to use this um, even more in our daily practice. So uh, mm -hmm. every time that we have a patient with cancer, we, we are going to have this more and more in um, this is a, our daily, we, we use this uh, genetic testing in, in our daily basis at least and uh, in, in, our, in my practice I use this and target therapy is, is reality of course that I live in Brazil we still have some issues about 
um, covering issues as um, covering uh, and because drug therapy is like, very expensive and sometimes we have this kind of problem and also genetic testing is a problem for, and sometimes because of insurance so we are having some debates here about that but uh, genetic genetics and genomics is a reality but we are still discussing the, the coverage coverage issues because it's a very important thing to debate also so this is a debate is an ethic debate for us here also so this is a problem so thank you Erica the next question is how can we get more education and training regarding SNP and the clinical utility And it says, is testing available throughout the country, and what are the cost insurance coverage that's available? And I think Erica addressed this for Brazil. Deborah, do you want to say something about it for the United States? Sure, sure. Well, there are certain tests um, now that are uh, covered by um, most of the insurers, and I think, you know, that's a, as Erica said, it's evolving. And um, now we're looking at panels of testing, um, for instance, in families where you may suspect there's a uh, hereditary predisposition, but not due to the most common genes um, that we typically test for, uh, such as BRCA1 or BRCA2. There are now multi multi-gene panels that look at several genes involved in the development of breast cancer. Uh, Insurance coverage for those tests is just beginning to uh, come into play here with, I think, I, um, that each individual case would probably need to be argued for at this point as to why that might be necessary and perhaps a more cost-effective approach than going through analyzing one gene after the next after the next. So we're on the forefront of all of this, and in terms of learning more about it, I think it's just keeping up with the literature, um, going to uh, formats such as the um, G3C um, case presentations um, that we are uh, working on and have several available already up on the website, um, wwwgc g-3-c.org, uh, and um, uh, just keeping up with the literature because this is a, a, a really um, a, um, evolving area. And speaking to your whoever is the person in your area who may be more um, involved in this practice at the current time, an uh, advanced practice nurse in, uh, working in genetics or a uh, genetic counselor, for instance. Well, thank you both very much for a very informative talk. And just to reiterate, um, these talks are videotaped and audio taped. Um, so they will be recorded and uh, archived on the genome.gov website. And at the end of Dr. Seibert's presentation, um, the listing of the website specifically on genome.gov will be provided. Um, so I'm going to open up the microphone for Dr. Calzone to introduce Diane Seibert. And as I change the presenter, over to Diane, um, she'll be introduced. Thank you very much, Erica and Deborah. So I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Diane Seibert. Um, Dr. Seibert is a, actually a practicing women's uh, health nurse practitioner, and she's certified in that capacity as well. Her current practice is at the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, formerly known as the National Naval Medical Center. Um, she is a prolific writer and is a professor and director of the Family Nurse Practitioner Program at the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences um, here in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, and so she is going to talk to you about the genetics of skin disease. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm delighted to be part of this part of this group. It's been fun to listen to the talks over the last few weeks, and um, I'm glad to be part of this 
little um, this edition for um, the Journal of Nursing Scholarship. Um, I am, um, as, as uh, Kathy said, a, a women's health and adult nurse practitioner, so the genodermatoses, the genetics of skin disease, wasn't something that I was all that familiar with until a couple years ago when I partnered with uh, Tom Darling, my co-author, on this paper. And he and I published an, an article in the Annals of Internal Medicine um, with an interesting population of his over at NIH, um, women, adult women with tuberous sclerosis who did not seem to have the classic um, TSC triad of features of um, facial angiofibromas, um, seizure disorder, and um, mental retardation. And those pictures on this particular slide show various features of this particular skin um, and inherited skin disease. And so I became I'm, I'm interested in this topic and I, I realized I hadn't really read a whole lot um, about the genodermatoses in the nursing literature, so I thought that I would like to tackle this, this uh, topic. So I'll take you with, with me on a journey as, as I kind of um, tried to figure out how to, to bring this topic to a larger audience. So physical, psychological, and ethical issues in caring for individuals with genetic skin disease is what I decided to, to call this paper. So just a bit of background, the skin is of course the first line of defense between our internal and external environments. And if you have healthy skin, it guards against pathogen invasion, protects against water loss, it helps you regulate your temperature, you feel um, sensations, it's part of our haptic sensation in terms of balance, and, and um, it helps us synthesize vitamins. There's been some really interesting work done related to um, maternal vitamin D exposure and um, type for example, type 1 diabetes development in, in offspring. So it's very interesting things related to skin. So the genodermatoses, which in fact was a word I didn't really know anything. I didn't know that word existed until about a year ago. These are mutations that alter the way normal skin works. Um, interestingly, and probably one of the things that Dr. Darling, my co-author, um, said when I first um, approached him about helping me or co-authoring this paper with me, he said, you know, genodermatoses, these are interesting in, in, in when you think of all genetic disease in that this particular set of um, mutations don't normally um, shorten lifespan. Not, there are some of them that do, but most of them do not affect lifespan, but they have significant impacts on social quality of life um, and social stigma because of the, the skin is so visible to others. And managing these disorders can be very complex. You first have to street, treat what's happening on the skin. You have to educate the patients and their families about this disease, but you also have to address the stigma. And again, this is, there's many places where nurses um, play roles in, in, in this, if you think about all of these um, pieces and parts. You need to treat and screen for the non-skin manifestations. As I said, you know, when I was talking about tuberous sclerosis complex, it's the facial angiofibromas, which are the skin pieces, but the seizure disorder and mental uh, cognitive um, impacts are significant for these diseases but recognize that there's lung um, tumors and also renal tumors as well. So the population that Tom and I were working with at NIH that we wrote the paper on were adult women who had, had, very, uh, they had the disease, but it was uh, not, not very expressive in them for whatever reason. And they, were, they had transitioned into adulthood without a diagnosis, and many of them had very severe pulmonary disease and um, were at high risk for um, lethal rupture of um, renal tumors. So the, the recognition of the skin manifestations may lead, the, lead you to uh, a, a more, potentially more important diagnosis of some internal structural problem that you can help um, prevent a, a bad outcome. You also need to make appropriate referrals, and that can be complicated in these disorders because, again, there are several uh, variety of organ systems that may be involved, so they may require a team approach or several different referrals to different people. When managing these diseases, it, um, roadblocks are pretty, pretty common, and, and until recently, dis deciding what the actual diagnosis was was rather difficult. Um, and we'll, as we go into the uh, talk a little bit further, you'll see, uh, I'll get, highlight some examples of that. There were very few effective treatments for some of these disorders. There wasn't much research, particularly in the rather rare, um, some of these rare recessive disorders. And as a result, and because they're rare, there were a few other affected people in your community that you could talk to, and with, with the advent of the internet, that's changing pretty uh, dramatically and helping this population of patients too. So diagnosis um, of these, some of these rare conditions is now possible, that we have gene sequencing and we know what, what um, genes to, to look for. 
the internet is, as I kind of mentioned, that people are able to look outside their communities, uh, local communities, for, for people that might also have these, these um, relatively rare disorders. And these, the internet is helping them find support groups. Um, and here are several that I, that I ran into as I was putting together this paper. Um, Talk Against Genodermatosis, very powerful, fairly um, robust site. Sir uh, psoriasis, albinism, um, incontinentia pigmentae, and um, an eczema support group. So just an example. Lots of things happening out there on the internet now. So a little bit about the genetics. I was stunned, really, to realize that there are over 500 genetic mutations that look like they cause somewhere in the neighborhood of 560 or 70 distinct skin disorders, 400 of which can be traced to a specific gene. But it's interesting because there's significant overlap between the disorders in terms of how they manifest on the skin. So categorizing has been rather a nightmare. And if you go back into history and look at textbooks of skin diseases, you'll find authors you know, here's a dry skin disorder, do we lump it with these other dry skin disorders? And so lots of confusion in the community about what categorize, you know, what category these disorders belong in. But as we have begun to better understand the physiology and pathophysiology of these skin diseases and the genetics of these diseases, they're settling on the genetic, the, derm, the dermatology community has uh, begun settling on classification systems. And there are about 12 of these categories based on the type of skin lesion and then they are further subdivided based on their inheritance pattern. Some of these disorders may surprise you. Um, osteogenesis imperfecta. I think most of us recognize that as a fracture, bony fracture, but there are also skin manifestations with that. Cowden's syndrome is, is considered a cancer um, syndrome, but there are skin features associated with that. Hypertriglyceridemias, okay, that's cholesterol, but skin shows up there. And hemochromatosis, iron overload, again, you know, there are skin features for all of these diseases. And so sometimes just highlighting or having clinicians recognize um, the, the external manifestations get you faster to a diagnosis for some of these. Basically, every inheritance pattern is represented um, in the genome dermatoses where there are autosomal dominant ones, recessive ones. There's X-linked, both dominant and recessive. There's mosaic. There are complex conditions, lots of those where there's several genes plus an environmental trigger. Um, and then, or an environmental, a chronic environmental insult. And then um, there's significant heterogeneity as well. Modifier genes are playing a role here for some of these, and it's certainly environmental factors. Exposure to sunlight, um, dry, dry climates, or, or humid climates, et cetera. So I, um, I, the chapter is divided into, uh, you know, I was working with inheritance patterns, and here's the complex disorders. I started there because it was um, the most common things atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. So um, about 15% of kids living in industrial, industrialized countries have atopic dermatitis. That's a pretty high number. And you realize that I put that word industrialized countries in there. That's an environmental exposure that seems to be triggering some of this um, skin disease. Symptoms, um, most people usually have symptoms that manifest in childhood and maybe make them absolutely miserable, hospitalized, etc. cetera. Um, but many of them. Um, Many of these um, individuals get better as they, as they age, so the skin seems to become um, a little bit different with age. The mutations appear to be largely centered in this uh, filigrin gene. There are four other genes that they're working with as well. The mutation appears to cause an abnormal enzyme, which um, prematurely dis uh, disables these uh, corneodecimones, and that causes an impaired barrier skin. So things like irritants, um, soap, detergents, etc., damage this fragile skin. It's not built very well. The allergens can get in, and then you have this inflammatory cascade. So atopic dermatitis really is a model for the gene-environment interaction, and it highlights the differences in expressivity, because not all severely affected people have these FLG mutations, and not all people with FLG mutations develop eczema. So, and then this whole idea that the older you get, the less disease you have is an interesting um, complex process too. The next one um, I thought I'd talk about is psoriasis. About up to 10% of people worldwide, and you notice that there's no industrial piece in here. So it seems that there's less of a role with um, industrialized communities or, or um, chemicals perhaps playing a role here. This is an autoimmune T cell disorder. There's an environmental trigger and a genetic susceptibility. So both of these two pieces have to be present. The 
symptoms very widely between people. And it's different than the, than the atopic derm dermatitis in that in, in psoriasis, there's a, a very rapid skin maturation. So the skin cells don't have this very nice paste growth. They, they accelerate the growth rapidly. The cells pile up on top of each other. That, the, immune, the immune system is not happy with that big callus type formation. And so the immune system comes in to clean that up. So when you have very severe psoriasis, and many of you may have seen patients with really, it's on the, um, sort of the external surface areas, uh, atopic dermatitis tends to be in folds and bends, and psoriasis tends to be on external, the outsides of elbows and knees and that kind of stuff. In severe disease, they've done some studies to show that quality of life scores for these patients is similar to that of patients with other chronic diseases like hypertension and depression and CHF and type 2 diabetes. So this can be a very debilitating disease. There's um, candidate genes, but recognize that these genes are not necessarily skin, uh, skin genes. These are um, um, immune genes like the, it, that you'll find in the HLA um, complex of genes, particularly HLA, this particular one, HLA, CW, 0602. And then interleukin um, genes seem to be involved. Um, these guys are also involved in immune modulation. So this is an immune um, mutation disorder. So here um, are some of the uh, monogenic or single gene disorders that I thought were uh, prevalent enough and interesting enough that, that you might a, see them or be uh, kind of be interested or they're markers for um, model disorders, I guess, for other skin diseases. So the autosomal dominant one I thought I'd talk about is Putz Jaeger's. Then at recessive we'll talk about albinism, and then we'll talk about one X-linked disorder, continentia pigment. So Putz Jaegers or PJS is an autosomal dominant cancer syndrome. And that picture up there shows you um, some of the skin findings um, inside someone's mouth. Um, the, it's the STIC um, and LKB1 tumor suppressor gene. If that gene is broken, their life, this individual's lifetime risk for developing cancers uh, is very, very high, 93%. In childhood, these um, individuals often have skin lesions, these dark blue or brown macules on fingers, um, faces, perianal areas. If you see these in any of your patients in childhood, you need to begin cancer screening, or you should at least consider this putz jaegers diagnosis. Um, it also comes at, because it is a cancer syndrome. This is a tumor suppressor gene that's broken. You'll see some other manifestations, um, hamartomatous gastrointestinal polyps, um, stomach, uh, small intestine, large bowel, nasal passages. Um, although these are rarely cancerous, they do get large and they do bleed. So anemia is a possibility as well as bowel obstruction and intussusception, in, in, in young, usually in younger um, children. And then epithelial cancers, colorectal, gastric, pancreatic, breast, and ovarian. So this is a pretty s a serious mutation. And the, if the skin can be the first thing that someone recognizes and it starts early uh, screening and intervention, um, you may have really gone a long way to improve someone's uh, overall survival and quality of life. The genetics are, are as I mentioned, it was in this, this uh, STIC11 and uh, LKB1 genes, but the, um, still not really clear how this genetics all works with putz jaegers because there are a number of de novo mutations, and it appears to be also heterogenic, where multiple genes are involved. So um, not everyone has the same genetic um, they may look phenotypically the same, but they don't have the same genetic um, picture. So when you find somebody has the clinical features, you counsel as you would for other autosomal dominant disorders and, and tell the, the family that the inheritance risk is about 50% and that if the mutation is known, prenatal testing is available for, for Putz Jaegers. Albinism. Um, it's an autosomal recessive disorder, um, and it involves melanin defects. Um, either the synthesis and or the transport of melanin in the skin. In the incidence around the world is about 1 in 17,000 individuals, but there's some pockets around the globe where the incidence is much higher than that. In sub-Saharan Africa, 1 in 4,000 Zimbabweans and almost 1 in 1,400 1 in 1, Tanzanians. So um, these communities have a lot of um, consanguinity, a lot of intermarriages, or even close marriages across across neighboring communities, and um, maybe not very much awareness of how this is actually inherited. The most prevalent form is this oculocutaneous albinism, or OCA, and there's four subtypes. Um, and it depends on how, what the mutations are like 
and if they're completely broken and make no melanin at all, or whether they produce still a little bit of, of melanin, um, really, really kind of drives how this patient is going to um, appear externally and how, how many manifestations they're going to have. Because melanin is interesting, is critical not only for the skin color, but it's also important for eye development. Um, obviously, you can see the picture on the top right, a lot of solar damage. So skin cancer is very common in this population. And the eye, it's not only just the fact that there's no pigment in the eye, but also the eye muscles. Um, so they have poor eye movement, poor visual acuity, and these children also then have difficulty reading and, cha and school challenges. They not only look different now, they actually have some, some um, intellectual, um, not, not cognitively challenged, but acquiring information is difficult. They have, again, high prevalence of skin cancer. And that, that in, this, in this culture in the United States, it may not be so unusual to see little kids at the beach wearing the long-sleeved things now. They're starting to do a lot of that. But in, in sub-Saharan Africa, it would be pretty unusual, and probably these people would be a bit shunt if they start wearing long sleeves and hats and things they need to do to protect their skin. So social stigma for these for these children in particular can be very very profound. They have very pale skin, pink eyes, they struggle in school, they often stay inside, they wear unusual clothes and clothing. And this is an extreme example of a social stigma, but in some South African albino communities there are body hunters that are actually looking for albino um, people, they kill them or they dismember them um, and make their body parts into good luck charms. So um, very scary, these uh, communities, that there are children that actually flee um, to this quote unquote safety of, of larger anonymous urban communities trying to, to stay alive basically, which increases their isolation and their marginalization. So this is a big, a big problem and so again it's the, the the skin mutation, if you can protect their skin and help them with their learning needs, it doesn't really um, affect longevity. But if the social stigma is so severe that they have to find themselves in, in a lonely community, isolated, it can be a very um, debilitating disease. Incontinentia pigmenta is um, a very rare disorder. It's X-linked dominant. What's interesting about this is I, I really learned more about X-linked. Most of the X-linked disorders that I had really thought about before were were really uh, recessive disorders. This one is dominant. So if you have one mutation, you're affected. And so that means that um, girls are affected. If you are a male and you only have one X and that one happens to be affected, you usually don't get out of embryogenesis. You're, um, or you're, if you make it to term pregnancy, you often die very early in your life. So the, the people affected by incontinentia pigmentae are, are women. There's only about 700 women around the world it's because it's lethal in virtually all men. You're not going to see it in boys. Um, the diagnosis is interesting because, again, it's, it's a clinical diagnosis confirmed by skin bi biopsy or now by gene testing. And the expression varies really widely. They have this very interesting development of skin lesions on, um, from birth into adulthood. They have this very severe blistering. And that's, this picture that I put up here doesn't really represent um, some of the pictures, if you go to a Google Images and do a search on this, you'll see some of the severe skin manifestations. But blistering till about four months of age, then this wart-like rash that appears for several months. Then they have hyperpigmentation for the rest of their lives. And they have these very interesting brown and slate gray lines, wavy lines. Again, you'll see some of those if you go do a Google search on it. And then they also have very interesting other features, like the um, alopecia, the strange teeth, um, formation of teeth dystrophic nails, cataracts, so again more eye features, retinal detachment, severe vision loss, again cognitive delay and intellectual disability, and then um, some, some very uh, potentially really severe um, skeletal abnormalities, hemivertebrae, scoliosis, spina bifida, syndactyly, and a congenital um, absence of the hands, um, all of which are caused by an X-linked mutation. So, what, what's the role of nursing? Uh, um, hopefully, as, as I went through this, kind of, again, quickly, you could think of ways in which you might interact with some of these patients. We are basically everywhere in healthcare. We're in, in, engaged with um, people in virtually every life event, from birth to death to every place in between. We're present in all healthcare settings. We work with all populations. And the public expects us to understand how genetic conditions are inherited 
um, the, again, those communities in Africa that need more education about albinism. Um, they, need to, they expect us to understand how common conditions um, are inherited, including things like skin diseases, like um, atopic dermatitis. They want us to help them navigate some of the social and ethical issues, recognizing that, that children with um, albinism have um, visual challenges as well as and helping them access those resources. Just understanding the relationship between the, the, the eyes and, and social outcomes is important. They um, also expect us to help them navigate some of these physical and emotional and social consequences of some of the disorders that they, they have. Um, they want us to help them get access to some reputable resources. There's lots of stuff on the internet and uh, again as I was searching around looking for things to bring to you, um, you run into in interesting and very unhelpful or misleading um, pieces of, of information. They want this stuff rapidly so that uh, you're, you're being facile with the computer really helps your patients. And then offering suggestions about coping, how to cope with some of the, some of the um, funny looks or the fact that no one will shake your hand um, or um, laugh at, your, at the way your, that your hair or eyes are, are colored, etc. So our job in terms of preparing nurses, my job here at the university, um, is to be aware of what it is that, that, that nurses need to know. And I, I think hopefully all of you are familiar with the two guidelines now that have been published related to what all nurses need to know, the essentials of genetic and genomic nursing competencies and with the outcome indicators from 2008, and then the new essential and genetic and genomic competencies for nurses prepared at the graduate level that was published last year. So in conclusion, really, nurses need to be familiar with the genodermatoses more commonly seen in your communities, need to be prepared to develop individualized care plans for patients and families with genetic concerns, and be able to discuss the ethical issues that surround genetic testing, which includes incidental findings. There's been some new um, work, ACMG released a new paper recently about how to, um, an approach at least to incidental findings. So skin diseases affect millions around the world. It's accompanied by significant morbidity, which includes quality of life um, issues, social stigma, isolation. Um, it's, we're still learning about the genotermatoses. Many people don't understand them very well. The ethical, legal, and social implications are similar to those um, patients that have other genetic diseases, including all the issues around genetic testing. And nurses are important because we can link the science of genetics with the human experience of health and illness. And we can make an important um, positive difference in the lives of our patients, um, with, uh, of all of our patients, but in this context, in patients with hereditary skin disease. So um, I, I think I will stop there and see if there are any questions or comments. Hopefully I can answer some. Like I said, I'm not a particular expert in this. So Diane, there was a question um, from an attendee who says, I had a patient with a sclerosed fibroma of the nose. The dermatologist recommended P10 testing. Is this lesion part of the P10 spectrum? That is a good question, and I don't have a good answer for that. I would have to, I'd have to do a literature search to find that answer myself. I don't know if Deborah um, or Erica or, or, or either you or Kathy have an answer for that. So I've opened up the microphones. Does anybody else want to address the P10 discussion about the fibrosis of the nose? What was it in the nose? I didn't quite get it. Let me read it. It says, fibroma, a sclerosed fibroma of the nose, and the dermatologist recommended P10 testing. Is this lesion part of the P10 spectrum? Well, there are um, sclerotic fibromas that can be seen in Cowden syndrome. So, um, it could be a cutaneous marker of the disease. Uh, I've not come across it myself, so I'd have to do a little more. I'd have to look look it up a bit and see if it if it actually meets uh, criteria for testing. But it, but it is a marker of uh, it that has been found in Cowden's disease before. So, Dr. So, Calzone, you want to tell them a little bit about the PDQ database where some of this information might be located. So PDQ at cancer.gov um, actually maintains evidence-based reviews of hereditary cancer 
syndromes and other associated um, variables. Um, if you go to cancer.gov, you can look at an individual topic. And in um, Cowden's, for example, it falls under the genetics of breast and ovarian cancer because it's a syndrome that is associated with breast cancer as well as other cancers. Um, and when you click on breast cancer at, at cancer.gov, you just scroll down to the genetic section and there'll be a whole section on the current evidence associated with Cowden's and the clinical criteria associated with the um, you know, indications for testing for uh, mutations in P10. Thank you. Um, any other questions that people want to submit, go ahead and do so. And um, Diane, could you move to the next slide, which also shows the next webinar coming up, if you have that available. Sure. So That's while good. we wait for the last few questions, um, just a reminder that the next webinar is April 26th, and it will be on autism as well as an update of childhood genetic disorders. So if you have colleagues that are interested in pediatric conditions, um, please tell them about how to register for this webinar for April 26th. So I don't see any other questions, so I'm going to open up the microphones to our presenters just to have one last word before we close out the day. Deborah, any other parting comments? Uh, well, actually, I did have a question. Um, Diane, that was an excellent presentation. Uh, thank you so much, and um, I certainly learned a lot. I have a question about uh, Pete Jager testing. I think you mentioned that there was prenatal testing available, and how would this be uh, useful, or is there some intervention that would be initiated um, that would um, uh, uh, justify prenatal testing, or is this something where people might even choose to terminate? Well, that's a really good question. I think that that comes up with a lot of the more the more we know about um, genetics, the more tempting it is to do things. Uh, preconceptually or conceptually. So if, if you know what the family mutation is, of course you can screen for it. You could do it pre-gestationally with a PGD, pre-gestational diagnostic testing, or you could test for it prenatally. That's a discussion that, that again, these patients should, in my view, the, these conversations should occur prior to conception, certainly. Um, what, what are you going to do with this information? Um, but the fact, the fact is that it, would, that it does exist. And so um, hopefully you're not first diagnosing something like uh, a cancer syndrome in um, early in pregnancy and have to then make a decision about whether you're going to do prenatal testing. I ideally, you do that uh, before you ever got pregnant. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to raise it's going to raise a lot of issues over the next decade or so. The cell-free DNA um, even increases you know, in potentially increases the sensitivity and decreasing the risk for normal fetuses, too. Erica, any last comment? No, I would like to say thank you to the presentation, and uh, I'd like to say thank you to the opportunity to discuss this with you. So uh, thank you all. Well, thank you for joining us from Brazil, and I know that is very difficult to make sure all these connections work, so thank you. And Kathy, any last comments? No, none here. We hope that uh, you'll join us in, um, for the next set of webinars that's coming up at the end of the month. So thank you, Diane and Deborah and Erica. Any other comment, Diane? No, I don't think so. I enjoyed it. Thank you. I think it was a good pairing of these two talks together. I appreciated the. I, I really learned a lot from the cancer one, too. So thank you. Thank you very that. much. Um, this is Deborah. So I'd just like to say that you know I think that we're we're in a very uh, rapidly developing era that is um, changing healthcare quite dramatically and will continue to do so. So uh, that webinars and um, publications such as in the Journal of Nursing Scholarship. Um, uh, are really necessary for nurses to be kept current about what's what's going on in these arenas and and to be able to not only use this information with their 
own patients uh, but, and families, but also uh, in even with um, other healthcare providers, including physicians and others who may not be aware of the latest developments. Well, thank you all, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.